real estate, real estate, real estate. Everybody is pushing real estate. Are, are, are we going to keep going up? What's happening? What's next? I mean, Brian, tell me. I think real estate bro has uh, really been something that's been popular on YouTube, right? And a lot of people see it as a subject that's simple, that's relevant to everybody. And a lot of people see money in it. And I think that's why it's become so popular. Um, but as far as the individual like me or somebody looking to become a salesperson, meaning a real estate agent, I think that's when they get slapped in the face with reality because, you know, as my brand has grown online and more people look at the world, I think I'm one of the few voices that actually is honest and real and raw about, you know, being an agent because it's not easy. So I think from an investment standpoint, it's become a lot more popular. But when people think, oh, selling real estate's easy, I watch Million Dollar Listing and HGTV and these guys make huge rips. They don't it, realize the it every day. Goes in, uh, that goes into it. And as my brand has become bigger and I'm higher up on the rankings and people actually start researching the career and they find out the reality. And the reality is that 90% of people, 91% now, the failure rate has gone up 4% in the last three or four years. So abundance of information out there, right? More free, more readily available, higher failure rate. Crazy, right? It's 91% is the failure rate? It was 87% when I got in. Uh, in 2000, end of 2013. Now, officially, it's I think they said 91%. So it's gone up 4% when me and some other people have given so much for free, dude, on YouTube to prepare people and help them. And the failure rate has gone up. So information and the availability doesn't necessarily mean people are going to be more successful. And the information is available everywhere. Brian Casella, you could literally just type it in into Google. <laughs> You can go on briancasella.com. That's C-A-S-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Um, his YouTube channel is probably the main spot you want to check out, you know, with a crazy amount of subscribers that you, you know, the milestone you hit over a hundred K subscribers and, and keep, and you're going and going. That's, that's huge, man. Congrats. Thank you, dude. Since, since we last spoke, cause not, I don't know if everybody knows if everybody goes back in time and, you know, we listens old episodes today marks exactly we think, get this. Get how crazy this is. One year to the day that we released last year's episode. Wow. That's nuts. Like, it was exactly August 6th. Like, what are the chances of that? Wow. Um, <laughs> That's crazy, dude. It was meant to be. It was. It was meant to be. Uh, so, yeah, Brian can sell everybody on Boss to Boss today. But real estate, you know, we, we talk about how, yes, it's trending. Uh, the failure rate is going up. It's constantly being talked about. Our, our, what, what, what happens now? It, let's just say this, does, you know, this shit does hit the fan. Let's just say it really does. What, what are you doing? What should others be doing to prepare? Because like, you know, we all kind of forget what happened because it's been a while. You know, it's been a beautiful 10 years. Uh, we all kind of forget. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot people can do, you know, as far as from an agent standpoint, like if somebody's in the business, you just kind of have to understand that, you know, we have no control over the market. So you just need to be able to adjust and roll with the punches, you know, and when the market gets a little bit tougher, what I've realized from interviewing top agents and being around them is their businesses actually grew when the market crashed because it weeded out the people who weren't committed. It weeded out the people who had no skills and what was left because there's still going to be people transacting in, in, in the market. There's still people that have to move, buy and sell property, but now they have a bigger piece of the pie to grab and obviously is the, the consumer has to educate themselves, right? You know, if they're thinking about making a move or they're thinking about planning for the future, the next five, 10 years and a crash or something like that does occur, then they need to be absolutely certain that they're making the correct plans based on what's happening, right? Me or you don't have control if the market's going to crash tomorrow or in a no, year or in six not. months. <laughs> what you can do is stay up to date with accurate information. And then when that time comes, be in a position to where you're going to be okay. This is one of the main reasons, bro, that, I have at this point, I think I have like seven or eight streams of income. You know, if the market crashes tomorrow or there's a huge earthquake and my team can't close any more homes, I'm okay. I'm not going to be, you know, kicked out, you know, all my cars and my houses and everything repoed and then be broke on the street. I'm going to be fine. Right. But I've created that situation for myself. So people need to, yes, keep building their income and keep growing, but they need to be prepared for some sort of catastrophe if it were to happen just in case, you know. And how did you, how did you prepare? I guess do you mind sharing with us, you know, your recipe, whichever part of it you could? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, you know, one of the one of the main 
we can say focal points for me when I got into real estate and started learning about it and becoming an agent was, you know, talking to these top dogs that had been through all kinds of markets. You know, uh, I've interviewed and talked to some guys who had been through the ups and downs and crashes of like, you know, the late eighties and early nineties, all the way through 2004 to 2008. And they're still in the business now. So they have a lot of experience that they can share. Um, so that kind of prepared me for it. And uh, they told me, right. Just like I had explained that they, they were able to grow when the market crashed. So that kind of uh, excited me. And I knew that was possible because whenever there's a crash like that, and if people didn't know, more millionaires were created from that crash than any other time in the history of the United States. So there's a big chunk of people who capitalized on one of the biggest catastrophes mm -hmm. in the history of the US economy and real estate market. Like that's a trip. And a lot of people don't believe me when I say that. So I tell them, do your research, right? But like some things that I did was, obviously preparing myself on the professional side for real estate, uh, multiple streams of income for sure, proper money management system, which I implemented about a year and a half or two years when I was in the business. And uh, two months from now will mark the sixth year that I've been in the real estate business. Um, and not being over leveraged with my real estate, meaning making sure I have equity and I'm not just pulling equity lines of credit from all my properties and being over leveraged. You know what I mean? So. But the main focal points I would say is the multiple streams of income. And the second one is proper money management. I think anybody, even at the basic level who isn't making a lot of money, if they manage their money properly, they'll be okay and they'll be able to survive these things. So I would say those are the two main focal points for me that has positioned me uh, against some sort of crash or, you know, huge catastrophe. And like, do you have a backup plan for your staff, for example, you know, like, cause I'm sure that's. Well, I've, I've helped them as much as I can. Um, you know, if there's a huge crash, uh, some of the people that are in my uh, office are brand new. So I don't know if they'd be in a position to survive. I know I can help them, but we have a plan in place for them to get there, you know? So within a little bit of time, I think they'll be there based on what I see in the market. I don't expect it to like really have any sort of crash like we did back 10 years ago. But if there is some sort of hard adjustment or some big correction, they'll, they'll be okay. They'll be okay. Why don't you think we're capable of, you know, having a crash like we did back then? Well, a lot, a lot of those, um, you know, when we look at those factors back in the day, like, I don't know if you've seen the movie, the big short, did you see it? Oh, of course. Yeah. I'm not yeah. to say that I'm like, hell yeah. I hope we crash and die. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> so, you know, a lot of it had to do with, uh, you know, some fraud, uh, a lot of people being dishonest, uh, on the lending side. So just from a mortgage standpoint, um, I still see that lenders are being very strict. I'm still seeing a lot of people being turned down. It's very rare for me to see like a stated income loan. And even if I do see that, the verification process is pretty rigorous and not just letting anybody through versus 10 years ago, I could walk into a, you know, a mortgage office and say, yeah, dude, I'm a gardener and I make 400 grand a year. They're like, okay, we'll give you a loan. Like it was that simple literally 10 years ago. So it's not a surprise when they were selling uh, that type of loan. And additionally, it was, um, adjustable rate mortgage. It was an arm, they call it adjustable rate mortgage. So you would keep that three or 4% for the first two years. Then the interest rate would jump up like two or 3%. So suddenly your 1500 mortgage payment goes up to 2,500, right? And people couldn't make the payments. So all those little things that I saw back then and in the movie, I'm still, if I am seeing it, it's very like the exception to the rule. I'm not seeing it as a norm, right? And I'm still seeing a lot of deals now. Uh, with underwriters coming in and really being strict and asking for extra stuff. So they're being meticulous on the lending side. With that still in place, we may see an adjustment, but I don't think we'll see some huge horrific crash because I think it was greed and uh, people getting money hungry that caused that crash 10 years ago, really. you know. And I think as long as we keep some sort of control and the regulations around that, you know, we'll see the normal ups and downs because any business or market has its cycles, but we won't see this horrific like uh, roller coaster just boom. You know what I mean? You think so though? I mean, the craziest things happen, right? And there's always the things we don't know about. You know, like it that could. Then. Yeah. Like we, I don't have the crystal ball, you know right. what I mean? You can't control that. But just from what I see based on, you know, the factors that would be from the people in in the market contributing towards it with you know fraud and that kind of stuff i just don't see that as readily as i did 10 years ago from the research and people that i've talked to so uh, you know it could be something else it could be uh, some outside force in the economy you know like i don't know but as far as from within real estate i don't see it as that being the you know the the tipping point for some sort of crash and that's kind of more industry-wide but 
when we focus back to the agent's standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, maybe, maybe the agents will hurt more because right now, every one of my friends is becoming an agent. <laughs> Everybody is selling real estate. Everybody. Like, and I, I don't know. I, I don't like to be like a bearer of bad news, but I like to be a realist too. Yeah. And it's like, well, I, oh, that trend, do you think that continues or do you think there's going to be a lot of unhappy people? Um, I think, uh, and I, again, I've talked to other people who have been in the business a while. Whenever the market is good, that's what happens. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, there's opportunity to make money in real estate. So now that we're seeing, because the market's been adjusting for a year, a lot of people haven't been keeping track. Like July, August of last year, I noticed that the luxury market here in Southern California was mm-hmm. already feeling an adjustment. And typically when there's an adjustment, or a correction, the luxury market will feel it first. So I started seeing those homes sit on the market a little bit longer, take a little bit longer to sell. And I was like, okay, the regular market beneath it is gonna start feeling it in the next couple of months. And that's what we saw. So for a period of you know uh, half a year, we saw the average sales price here in Southern California drop like seven, eight percent within six, seven, eight months, which isn't a huge correction, but that's a pretty big chunk compared to the last couple of years, every year it's been going up 10, 12, 13, 14, 15%. So I was already, because I'm keeping up with the market, I was already ahead of the curve and I was already educating people about it, right? Now, you know, two or three months ago, I start seeing people saying, oh, the market's really crashing and it's adjusting. It's like, dude, it's been doing this for a year. Where have you been? But that from an agent standpoint is something that agents need to do, right? Especially if they want to survive, you need to look at your local market take a look at what's happening. And it's very simple. I can go on my multiple listing, which is the multiple listing service where we have all the active homes, sales, pending yeah. sales. And all I need to do is look back two, three, four, five months to see a pattern, you know? And if I see that sales are decreasing in the last three or four months in a row, but active homes being put up for sale is going up, then that's an indicator to me it's slowing down. Less homes are selling, more homes are going up for sale. Like it's really simple stuff and it takes a few minutes of research every day. And that among some other things is why I think a lot of people uh, have trouble in this business is they're not willing to do those simple little tasks that keep you ahead of the curve. You know, do you think it's cause a lot of people go on Instagram and that's all people show They show their, their new listing, their new sale. Part of it. Yeah. Part of it is uh, industry wide. The training is very bad. Like I've had brokerages tell me, right. And I'm not going to say who, cause uh, I don't think that's right. But, this is cool and it's also kind of sad at the same time. They use my YouTube content to train their agents. And I'm like, that's cool, but it's also kind of sad that it took a new kid getting into real estate making free YouTube videos to finally inform people about some basics in real estate. Like that to me made it very clear there's some sort of hole or issue within the business and this industry if, again, me coming out of the blue, making free videos of what I thought was obvious you know, that other people are using, oh man, we're using all your videos. And I was just like, whoa, like th- that's insane. So that I learned by doing my own efforts and going out there and hunting for that information and gathering it. So the person coming in a little bit more naive from watching these TV shows is like, okay, I'm going to show up. I'm going to get training. Well, in most cases you show up and they're like, there's your desk, there's your phone, get to work. And then you're sitting there deer and the headlights look and you're like, uh, what do I do? So A lot of it is going to require that self-initiative for people to get good. So industry-wide, they really need to uh, give more training. But I think people just don't care. They they really don't because the revolving door of people coming in and out for most brokerages is always going. There's always new blood coming in. So they can always count on making some sales because the broker, the principal broker makes a piece off everybody's sales. So if they have 200 agents, they don't care if people are dropping in and out every month. They have 200 agents. It's a numbers game, right? It's a numbers game. Exactly. Numbers game. And that's so interesting. So what happens? Like, how does that work that they use your content? Like, do they have to pay you or anything? Or um, All I say is if they give me credit, it's cool. Now, if it's a company who is selling some sort of license, licensing course or training course and they're charging, then yes, I would require that they pay me a little bit, one. But two, I actually have to approve of that company and what they do. Mm-hmm. I don't want to associate myself with a company who's a scam exactly. or who doesn't do a good job. So... Um, you know, I've kind of done some research and found out who's been using my stuff and who hasn't. But as far as I know, only two, two companies that charge, Mm -hmm. it's a small fee. They're using my stuff, but it's okay. Cause it's like a, kind of like a general platform to train agents. And I don't mind my stuff being on there because all it is, is getting the word out. And it's like an education platform. And I'm totally for that because ultimately me and a lot of the other influencers who just want to inform people and help them 
you know, if they're getting in the business with the intention of staying and doing well, we want to lead them down the right path. The only issue is there's a lot of fluff because me and other people, it's organic. We're not advertising with some of these other guys that push BS are advertising. So that's the main thing. Oh, cold calling is dead. Door knocking doesn't work. You don't have to work hard, right? It's like, dude, but I get it because they're feeding on people's weakness. They feel lost. They want the easy way out and they're going to go that way. Then I come and I'm like, hey, man, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to get slapped. You're going to get punched. You're going to bleed. Your teeth are going to get knocked out, but it's okay. You can do it. So they fun. see me and they want to run away. They're like, oh my God, this guy's saying work hard. I don't want to do that. I'll just go to this guy who, who's selling me this magic bullet where I can just sit back and watch the leads come in. And then I come up and show up and say, dude, but when that lead comes in, you have to talk to him on the phone or meet with him in person. What are you going to do? You don't know what to say, right? You don't know what the process is. You have zero training. You have zero confidence. You don't know how to communicate. You really think you're going to get the deal? And that's when they're kind of like, uh-oh, and the realization comes, you know? <laughs> and that's kind of, I mean, and there's a reason why you have as many you know, followers as you do and as many you know, watches on your videos, you know, when, when you're real versus when you're just fluffing things up. It's going to come out sooner or later, I would think. And um, I guess with uh, techniques regarding real estate agents, you know, mm -hmm. is there some kind of, some people say that it's the ability to get leads, that it's the ability to close. So at the end of the day, you are a, a salesman, right? Absolutely. And 100%. Yes. So being, I guess, you know, kind of taking the real estate part out of it, just being like a salesman, like, you know, what techniques do you recommend, like what are your go-tos that aren't just, you know, for California, but across the U S or worldwide, like what are techniques that you recommend and you push the most? Oh man, there's so much dude, you know, communication itself is, is so vital, you know, especially now going into 2019 and 20, we see more and more people being drawn to like, if you look at the dating world, it's all apps now, right? You look at networking, people are going on apps to network. So there's less communication and, and more, texting, virtual, swipe left, swipe right. And I've always told people communication, if you can communicate at a very high level, you're going to live a very successful life because you can get what you want. Right. And that's one of the biggest uh, issues that I see is I've come across so many people that are incredibly intelligent and talented, but their communication is garbage. It sucks. Right. And I'm like, dude, you're a genius, but you communicate like you're three years old. It's okay. You weren't taught properly. So when it comes to sales, it's a science, I tell people. And if you learn from anybody, if you learn from me, if you do any basic studies, you're going to learn the one, two, threes of sales. Okay. For example, a lot of people think, hey, if I'm a good talker, I'm going to do very well. No. Yeah. Selling is asking questions and listening. It's not talking. So all these people that are talkers, they talk themselves out of sales. When I'm selling somebody, you don't see me talking that much. I'm listening more. I'm listening 80% of the time and speaking 20% of the time, okay? Because I want the person to speak. Another thing is people aren't very good listeners. They don't make eye contact. They interrupt each other when they speak. If we're going to start with sales, let's just go basic communication one-on-one, right? Give somebody a good handshake, make good eye contact, do not interrupt them, listen to what they're saying, ask good questions, find out what their needs and wants are, and then be able to communicate that you're the solution to it, right? Now, there's so many levels when it comes to studying sales and those kind of things. But uh, if I can give any other thing, it would be we need to uh, get out of this zombie mode. Okay, so anybody listening to this podcast, the next time you get in your car and drive around, take a look at the other drivers and cars and tell me if you see other human beings because I don't. I just see this. Oh, man. And then if somebody That's happens to cut them off, <laughs> it's like they're beasts, That's wild beasts driving cars right? That are asleep and hibernating most of the time. So if you simply smile and you have even a little bit of spark in you, that's going to get people's attention because this is energy. We're attracted to energy and vibes. If somebody has a good vibe, somebody has a, you know, positive energy, our minds like that must, that person must be winning in life. They're happy. They're smiling. I'm not, most people aren't happy. So like, I want to get around that person that initially attracts people and gets them to listen to you. So if you can smile and have energy and then have basic communication skills, you're already a million miles ahead of everybody else. Now, before I pass it back to you, bro, one of the main issues I see now too is some people will watch videos on this stuff, you know, but they're not implementing it. So when they get with their friends and little clicks, it's now become like this bragging right. Oh, I study him. I study Grant Cardone. I study this. I study that. So it's like bragging rights to who I've studied. 
but they can't actually demonstrate. I'm like, okay, cool. That's great. Show me how it's done. That's and then they great. give me some explanation about why they can't, but they know how to do it. I don't want you to regurgitate the information. I want you to be able to demonstrate that skill, right? So I see the culture going that way where people just brag about what they've done because I'm talking and interacting with a lot of people and I see that and I'm like, show me and they can't. So what's the point of studying it if you can't do it? And I guarantee you a lot of people listening to your podcast are in that category where they know it, but they don't really know how to do it. And kind of, you know, going further with that, you know, being, since being an agent, you know, technically is being a salesman. Do you feel that salesmen get sold a lot themselves? Because, you know, a lot of these people, they're, they're in it, you know, for the rush or they're just in it because they're, they're, they believe they're good in it. But then they get sold on all these different programs, all these different things. I mean, do you almost feel like it's a full circle? Yeah, I'm an easy sale, I think, you know, but I'm also decisive and I know what I want. And I think that's one of the reasons is when you get deeper into it, you know, you appreciate somebody else. Like if somebody's using techniques on me, I can see it a mile away but I appreciate the effort and that they're doing it. And even if they're not doing it perfect, it's like, okay, at least this person is taking their job serious. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm an easy sale when I know what I want. So I I think absolutely it goes hand in hand and because it all starts and ends with us, bro. You know, like if I want to be able to sell you on something, I need to be able to sell myself first on it. And if I can't sell myself first or be sold myself on something, how can I possibly sell you? It's the same thing with confidence or love. If I can't love myself, how can I expect somebody to love me? If I can't um, appreciate myself, if I can't <clears throat> listen to my own voice and watch my own videos and be like, cool, I did that and appreciate me, how can I expect somebody else to appreciate me? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, no, it's, 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 it's interesting, right? How it's kind of like, uh, do you ever catch yourself just listening extra? Like you'll get that call or whatever it is. And instead of just like cutting them off, you'd be like, you know what? I'll listen to it. Absolutely. I've done my dues. Like I, I can listen to it. Yeah. You know, I'll give them a shot. Sometimes I, I just throw the people on the phone objections just to see what they say. I've had some people where they call and I give them tips. I'm like, Hey dude, let me give you some tips to, to get more sales. Cause I, I appreciate that hustle. You know, even if I don't want the call, I appreciate the fact that they're doing it. Cause I know what it takes to make those calls over and over and be told to F off and go shove it where the sun don't shine. And you know, I understand cause I've been through it a million times, you know? Oh man. Uh, so what else has changed in a year? You know, it's been exactly a year. So it's pretty awesome. You know, we're reconnecting after one year here after initially connecting through Travis chapel and his, uh, and his podcast. But, uh, w- what are some changes? First of all, we don't, we don't see the big green screen. We see you <laughs> in a new office environment. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we got some, uh, some other changes as well, right? Yep. Few <laughs> few tattoos. Any, any specific, so these kind of just came just all of a sudden, I thought, I swear, I thought you had one, but I guess you didn't, but all of a sudden you got like 10 of them. Yeah. Right? Everybody thinks I had tattoos, bro. Well, a lot's changed, man. A new office, obviously I moved in. Um, I started boxing since the last time we, we talked, um, uh, you know, obviously all my numbers have gone up. Um, these tattoos, I turned 33, uh, in June and I've been wanting shit, my first tattoo since I was 19. So these have all been ideas and sketches that have been on notebooks and papers for years. I just finally decided to start getting them now. Um, so, you know, each individual tattoo means something to me. It's not just like a fad, like, Oh, I want to get tattooed. You know, I tell people, if you're going to get one, understand that these are permanent. So make sure that you want what you're going to get. If you have an idea, I'd recommend you sit on it for a couple months, maybe a year and really decide, do I want this? They're coming on me quickly because these are tattoos I wanted for a long time. So this isn't just off a whim or a picture I saw. Hey, let's get that tatted, which is what a lot of people think. They think I'm doing it off impulse and like I'm addicted. I'm not. Um, Let's see. I've had a lot of cars in the shop over the last year and I'm finally getting them back. My Supra, I'm getting it back end of this month. I got my Subaru, my 2007 STI back. I'm rewrapping and doing a new setup for the Lambo, the Huracan. I'm getting that back in the next week or so. Um, Obviously, my coaching program has exploded, dude. In February, I did my first event for the coaching members and I actually have my second one here uh, this weekend, August 10th. Uh, yeah, the coaching program is the one that you initially, Modern Success, right? Modern Success, yeah. So when we we're, spoke last time, I probably kind of, had yeah, 60 launching. people in it or 70. Now I have almost 300. So it's really grown and that's been organic. It's not 
paid advertising behind it. It's been all organic. And I kind of did it as an experiment because we're going to start doing ads. But I said, you know what? How far can I take this organically? Right. And I know people who have 500 or 1,000 people in their coaching programs, but they're throwing a ton of money in ads to keep that up. I'm not. I'm just putting stuff out. So that's cool. Um, other than that, man, it's just been um, you know, a steady growth, right? Everything that I've projected to you, everything that I've been doing, like the real estate team, uh, my coaching programs, my products, uh, the speeches, um, it's just been all exponentially growing. Like this, this year, I'm doing at least one out of the area speaking gig every month. And some months I'm doing oh, two nice. or three, right? And they're all paid. I've obviously doubled my fees since last year. I used to only charge $1,000 to speak with flight and all that arranged. Now it's 3,000 minimum speaking fee. By the end of this year, I'm probably gonna bump that up to five, right? And I keep just increasing that. Um, so it, it's just been a steady growth, dude. I mean, You got some like me. notable areas you're uh, speaking at? Uh, Australia, went to Australia. <laughs> Sweet. Um, I'm gonna go to Texas. Uh, let's see next month uh, in about two weeks, I'm going to be in Florida and Orlando, Florida. I've never been there. I'm speaking with the uh, Florida association of realtors. We're doing like a three or four day event. Got to hit up Disney world, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've done a ton of California. Uh, I'm going to Canada next year. I already have that scheduled. I have New York on the, the list as well. I'm going back to Miami, I think within the next three months. So I'm all over the place, dude. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so kind of backtrack and back to your tattoos um, <laughs> is there one? Cause you know, the only one I got was after I had too much wine. So, yeah. you know, that, that wasn't the most memorable one. Is there one that like sticks out to you that like has the most meaning out of all of them? Cause it seems like, you know, there's definitely a lot going on and you put some thought to it. Uh, there's a lot, man. But I mean, if I can note one, it probably would be this one. You probably can't see it, but I got abracadabra tattooed right here. Right. Uh -huh. And for a lot of people who don't understand the magicians would say abracadabra and then reveal their thing. Abracadabra basically means I create as I speak. When I, I speak it into existence. And the last couple of years through my studies, I realized the power of the word and the thought. So for me, that tattoo had a, a huge significance because I'm very meticulous about, mm. you know, when I listen to people and I'm helping them and their use of language, the language that I choose to use, how I think, how I visualize, because I know my current reality and where I'm going has been solely created initially because of my thoughts and my speech. So abracadabra to me is the result of my life, right? This has been the root of me creating what I've created, the money I'm making, the success that I'm having, the impact that I'm having. It all started here and here. So to me, that's of extreme significance for sure. And I put it right here on the side of my wrist because a lot of times when I speak, I point or I do that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to be visible to not only me, but everybody else. Huh. I like that. Oh man, that's, you got me, you got me thinking now. Like that's, that's no, cause you're incorporating a visual <laughs> literally <laughs> as you're speaking a visual. Yep. So that's, that's totally. pretty badass. I like that. Um, well, uh, now on to our listeners favorite segment of the show. Welcome to the round with no name. Cause they're all taken. I don't know how much you remember last time, but we kind of changed things up a little bit. Got a little okay. curveball thrown in Steve Wiley, the producer, um, he still is a leg breaker. He still, he still is a very bad guy and I don't like dealing with him, but, but he, he's awesome when it comes to podcasting <laughs> and you're going to get five seconds, just a couple curveballs at you, you know, see where you're at, just throw, throw it out there, throw it out there and we'll discuss, uh, afterwards. Cool. Uh, if one of these, uh, answers is, is ridiculous enough. Um, <clears throat> what is your favorite car? Favorite car, uh, R34 Skyline GTR. What about a favorite car that you own? That I own right now, my Supra, my Toyota Supra 1997 Anniversary Edition. Favorite boxer? Roy Jones Jr. Favorite podcast? Uh, Supreme Being. Prediction for when officially the market crashes? Maybe not, it could be a small crash, but a crash. Uh, 2021. If uh, you had unlimited amount of money right now and you could start up any business you wanted to, what would it be? It can't be your own. Um, it would be a, like a, a speaking and touring for personal development and helping people break through limitations and that kind of stuff. Similar to kind of what Tony Robbins does with like Unleash the Power Within. Would, do you think you would leverage the money to 
just market the shit out of it? Yeah, that and get some sick venues for sure. And then some of the activities that I do in it, I would have some guest speakers that are probably celebrities or, or them there to create the buzz. And then to be able to get the good venues and, and fund the traveling and all that and then make the tickets affordable for people. Are you still sipping on yerba, your yerba mate every yerba single mate. Of course, <laughs> every morning, bro, every morning. And last but not least, if we had a serious business meeting right now, how, ser- how, how mad would you be if I did show up in socks and sandals? Uh, I wouldn't be mad. Come on. I, I, know, I know a part of you, a part of you would hate it. You would hate it, right? I wouldn't do it as long as the sandals and the socks are dope and we're good to go. You would take me seriously? Yeah. You know, and I've learned that dude through real estate. You know, I've had people show up and buy houses that are in flip flops that have millions of dollars in cash in the bank. So, um, as I, I understand what you mean as far as business protocols, Mm -hmm. but if it's me personally, um, I'm only going to hold it against you. If everything about you screams that if you come in smelling like trash, you didn't shower, you have socks and and, and sandals on then maybe, but if we're talking a serious idea Mm -hmm. and you're an entrepreneur, and we're going to talk and you show up in sandals. Like, I don't care. I'm here to listen to your idea. I, I could care less how you're dressed. Cause if we can work together and make money, I'm all for it. You know? Exactly. Well, uh, you know, you survived. I survived. I mean, you, you were going to survive. It, it was me that I was worried about, but Steve didn't come out. So we're good. <laughs> yeah, I got the questions out in time and, uh, we're good. We're good. But, uh, yeah, cause no, you, you are definitely very about image. I mean, you, you know, w- when we see you, we see Brian Casella. We, we see some of Pablo there too. Yeah, um, because, you know, it's like I was telling you, I, I know, you know, the outside. And for example, like the studies that they do, if somebody, they did like this experiment where people were jaywalking and when the guy in a suit jaywalked, everybody followed him because we respond to that. So I understand that <laughs> dynamic and I utilize that to my maximum. But, you know, if this is like a meeting that I make, then I'm not really going to care personally, you know, so. Uh, but I, I get where, where that is and that science and, and that whole thing of imagology, of course, it's relevant, 100%. How close are you uh, to getting that GTR? That's actually my, uh, uh, you said GTR, right? As your yeah. favorite car? Well, the R34, one? the previous generation, not the one that's mainstream now, the one that came out between yes. 1998 yes. and 2003, which is the one that Paul Walker had in the second, yes. the Too Fast, Too Furious, that gray one. Yeah, that's so that's R34. like my dream car too. Uh, <laughs> that is... I mean, well, you can't even get it here technically, right? I've seen like a couple that yeah. some wasn't it Paul Walker's original that got that stayed out here. Yeah, there was that one, and then uh, there was a company called Motorex, M O T O R E X. They originally, I think, imported like a couple dozen. So mm-hmm. the ones you see floating around here are those, and they've either traded hands or somebody wrecked them, and someone else bought it and then rebuilt it. Uh, but yeah, technically, there's a 25 year import rule. So you can't have them until I believe starting 2023 or 2024. So are you waiting till that time or are you going to do everything in your power to land one of the 12 that are here? (laughs) I believe I'll get one before that. Um, I have it kind of a a rough date in the calendar to at least be in a position to buy it and pull the trigger by uh, June of 2020. But don't you like have to hide it then? Right? Can't they technically take, take it away? There's, there's ways around it, dude, you know, registering in different States, uh, registering it under a car dealership as a show car. I mean, there's, there's so many loopholes in it. Or if I get one that's already been locally imported and registered under motor Rex and some of these other loopholes, then I can totally have one without a problem. And don't worry, we'll, we'll cut that whole part out of the podcast. No one will ever heard, hear anything <laughs> about it. Nothing. Oh, All right, man. Well, yeah, that's uh that's Brian Casella. Everybody check out Brian Casella.com. Uh, on, on YouTube, Google, you know, type him in, you'll, uh, you'll find out, um, his, uh, his mentorship program, uh, modern success, uh, as well as, uh, you, all types of courses, right. You have, and, um, that you can check out on your website. You have all types of products, including, including, um, a, uh, a guide to, uh, you know, I guess how to present yourself, right. And how to, how to look and how to appear, which you did with, uh, with Pablo. Yeah. I mean, Um, image for entrepreneurs. I mean, I have a ton of stuff, you know, the, the standalone products still sell, but Mm -hmm. most people, um, I push them into modern success because that's the community. That's the support system. That's I'm active in that every day. We have weekly lectures, so it's much more immersed versus just being one specific product on one specific thing, you know? And how's the podcast going now? Cause I know when we first spoke, you were kind of, 
you weren't even into it yet. I, I don't believe at that point. Yeah. Um, I think I started it. Um, you were just about to, or you were like, maybe yeah, it was episode. like November of last year or December. I can't remember. I, I've done, I do two, sometimes three episodes a week. Um, but it, it's doing well, dude. I mean, I think I'm averaging um, like uh, between a thousand and fifteen hundred downloads a day on the podcast usually. So oh, it's damn. Well. Oh, that is, that is. I, I know you were, uh, you know, that was the next avenue for you. So you know, yeah. let me know if you want to talk further about podcasts. <laughs> Absolutely, but, uh, dude. Yeah. No, it's been a pleasure having you on, boss to boss. Uh, Mike is yours. You know, as always, if you want to finish off, got any, any final words for us, for us over here in the cubicles looking at get out and, and possibly become real estate agents. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, pick whatever you want to do. If you want to be a realtor, go for it. Uh, there's plenty of resources out there for you. You just have to pull the trigger and commit to it. You know, it's not going to be easy, but, um, you know, people have walked that path many times before you, so it can be done, definitely. Why, why recreate the wheel, right? Yep. <clears throat> exactly. All right, man. Been a pleasure uh, having you on. As always, looking forward to seeing, you know, where you're at next year. And, you know, hopefully uh, by then you'll have a million followers and, I'll be, I'll be over here like, come on, Brian, please, please, <laughs> please get on the show. And maybe one day you'll get back to me. <laughs> Yo, dude, yeah, we'll do it again for sure. Appreciate it. That is all for this episode of Boss to Boss. Your next step is to visit boss2boss.com where you will find proven techniques followed by professionals to help you make that next step. Again, that is boss, the number two, boss.com. And remember, the time is now.